Thank you. Uh, so, uh, shout out to all the women who are married. I play that really bad. That walk up the aisle and everyone's staring at you. Man, that's nerve wracking. <laughs> so good on you, man. Congratulations. My goodness. Uh, so, children of God. So, uh, we're probably one of the newer small groups here uh, at Sawyer's Creek. We've been around for a couple years only. Um, we're a little bit more contemporary in nature. We do a lot of the uh, kind of younger uh, kind of pastor studies. Uh, we're video based uh, predominantly. Uh, so we'll kind of go through roughly 10, 15 minute video and then we can just kind of break it out and talk about it in, in a small group setting. I get to share a lot of ideas. Um, you know, like, so right now we're doing uh, Craig O'Shell's winning the, winning the War of Your Mind. So we're diving a lot into identifying the lies that we tell ourselves, identifying the lies that the world tells us, and then taking that and learning how to reshape those thoughts uh, into productivity um, and kind of re, uh, kind of recarve out the positive mindsets uh, to kind of then uh, help spread the word. Uh, the name of our class is a little misleading, Children of God. Uh, we are not a children's class. Uh, <laughs> So we are a young adult class. Uh, so the quick history lesson. So a handful of years ago, um, David Eilert kind of identified a need for a small group uh, that kind of just graduated high school. Uh, so that 18 to 25 year old demographic. Uh, so uh, he created uh, this group, uh, but that demographic's hard. There's just not many people uh, in it. So we then started kind of pulling people that I would say is young in faith, right? So. Um, I had recently uh, just started coming to this church. My wife Amanda recently started coming. Uh, and we pulled in some younger kind of faith people in. Uh, and then it's kind of just expanded uh, into a very uh, kind of collective kind of group. And we range, uh, you know, we have uh, Paul Sawyer uh, in there, but then we also have David Eilid who's, you know, <laughs> in there. And then everything in between. <laughs> I love you, brother. I love you. <laughs> Uh, so the class is taught by three of us. It's, uh, it's myself, it's David, uh, and then Hunter Lowe in the back. Uh, so uh, it, it's a good time, man. We have fun. Uh, it's, it's a lot of group conversation. Uh, it's, a lot of, uh, it's a lot of sharing real-world real experience. You know, when we talk about fears and worry, uh, things like that, like we, we try and draw uh, directly from those people, you know, for us to share how we actually feel. And then we really collectively as a group try and come up with, with uh, some answers. Uh, so it's a, it's a fun time. If you want to know about uh, the island's cats, uh, sissy, uh, it's always good for a good story to kick us off every morning. Uh, so uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, let Hunter Lowe, David, or myself know. And uh, if you want to come join us, we're in the, uh, the little hobbit hole, small corner there, uh, back by the kitchen in the fellowship hall. Other than that, thank you guys. I appreciate it. <laughs>
Father, we thank you for this opportunity to celebrate what Jesus did for us. We thank you that he spilled out his blood on our behalf, Lord, to take our place on Calvary's cross, to do the thing for us that we could not do for ourselves. And Lord, as we celebrate that great salvation today, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to the truth of Scripture. I pray if there are any in the sound of my voice, Lord, that have not reconciled their faith with you and maybe are a little confused about what it means to be to be saved, Lord, I pray that today would answer all of their questions, and if they have not given their life to you, that today would be the day where they declare you the Lord of their life and receive that free gift of salvation that you provided for us on the cross. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We're going to be jumping around scripture today, and so uh, if you want to, the scriptures will be on the screen, but I'd also encourage you, if you have your Bible or your Bible app, to try to keep up with us, um, because we're going to be talking about something as a, a faith community uh, that's going to be very important. Uh, over the next three weeks, we are going to talk about uh, three important elements of the Christian faith, foundational elements of the Christian faith. And the goal of this series is to help you get a better handle on doctrines that will quite literally change the way that you understand the world that you were brought into. These doctrines are powerful and they're important to learn. And so if you're an adult or a teenager or even a child, I would encourage you to go back and, and bookmark this sermon so you can listen to it again. I would encourage you to also take very good notes over the next three weeks. So if you have a, a pen or a pencil, go ahead and get those out, and uh, you can use your bulletins. I provided a few notes there for you, but um, not an all-encompassing amount of notes, and so you're going to want to add to that list. And uh, also, maybe pick up some books on these three subjects. Today, we're going to be talking about salvation. So listen to podcasts, pick up books, do devotionals, get to know these um, these, these doctrines, because they will quite literally change your life and the people's lives that you choose to build relationships with. So what we're going to work for is some, some aha moments, some aha moments, so, some moments of, of sudden discovery. It's kind of like the light bulb over the inventor's head when he comes up or she comes up with a good idea. Uh, for me, it was when I was building my, my front porch um, I was trying to get a nine-foot piece of uh, two-by-four to be a, a railing on my porch. And so I'm, I'm holding the railing, and I'm sticking it up against the post, and I, I'm trying to uh, toenail the, the screw into the wood, and my son is holding the other end of the wood, and it keeps tilting, and it keeps going up. Like, I just could not get this thing level to save my life. And so I'm like, Eli, go get your sister. Yeah, the seven-year-old with the broken arm. Um, so she comes out, and she's got her cast, and she's laid the, the two-by-four across her cast to try to keep it level. And I'm still trying to, and it keeps going left and right. And so finally, um, Andy Page walks by. And uh, by the way, if you're an old school, like, uh, Sawyer's Creek Baptist Church member, yes, I'm very grateful that Troy is not across the street watching this take place. And so the few of you that get that inside joke, um, that was for you. But uh, anyway, so I'm trying to get the board in, and, and uh, Andy Page walks by, and he sees our, our plight, and he, he hands me a two-by-four. And he's like, use this as a spacer, right? So I put the, uh, aha, uh, so I put the spacer in there, and then I'm able to hold the board flat and make the railing. One simple tool changed my life, and so it was this aha moment for me. And so what I'm going to try to do for you today is provide some, some tools in regard to the doctrine of salvation that will quite literally give you an uh, aha moment, right? I want you to experience salvation at a, a newer and deeper level. Now, some of you are great theologians, and maybe you already know all this stuff, but there, there should be some moments in here today as we do a deep dive into this doctrine uh, where that little light bulb might go on for the first time for some of you. Scott Ball is the lead pastor at Journey Church down in Florida, and he informed a lot of this sermon with his four simple questions that he asked. He says, why do I need to be saved? Why did Jesus have to die to save me? How do I get saved? And what happens after I become saved? And so we're going to talk about all four of those questions this morning. Why do I need to be saved? Well, because you're a sinner. <laughs> probably not your aha moment right there. You probably already knew that. But some of you might say, well, my mom thinks I'm awesome. Well, you are. You are awesome. But you're also a serial sinner. Um, and that doesn't mean you eat too much Lucky Charms. Sorry, that was a dad joke. Um, <laughs> well, serial sinner means that you sin continually over and over and over. How do I know that? Because the Bible says so. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. Your pastor has sinned. You have sinned. Your mom and dad have sinned. Uh, the nicest person you know, we have all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. See, God alone gets to tell us what is right and what is wrong. 
because it's his creation. He made everything, and so he gets the first and the last word on everything, and he says there is a target way to live. Love God, love your neighbor, don't be a racist, no idolatry, honor your parents, don't be greedy, don't be jealous, and if you do these things, then God says that life will go swimmingly well for everyone. But sin is an archery term, and it means to miss the targets when we veer away from God's ordered way of living. And there are three consequences to sin. The first one is an external consequence. It's the fact that sin broke our world. The world around you is broken. Pick any statistic you want. Sexual abuse, slavery, homicide, drug use, poverty, starvation, all of those are at all-time highs right now. The world around you is broken because of sin. And by the way, it's not God's fault. It's our fault. The second consequence of sin is more of an internal problem. We have been hurt by other people's sin. We have hurt other people by our own sin. Our own bodies, our frail bodies have have hurt us when they kind of fall apart. And then the third consequence of sin, the one we're going to focus on the most today, is that our relationship with God is broken. This is the spiritual consequence of sin. See, God gave Adam and Eve a choice in the garden. He said, you can follow and obey, and if they did that, they would never even know what sin is. And so you say, well, why would God even give them a choice? Why did he put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden to tempt them? Why did he even give them the choice? Because we're talking about love, and love requires a choice. And so they chose to give in to temptation. They ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and because of that, sin entered into our world, and they were awakened to the reality of sin. It's kind of like when you were a child, you know, when you're a little baby and you're a little kid, like a toddler, and you, you really don't know right or wrong yet, and so you might say a word that you shouldn't say, or you might do something that you shouldn't do, and you don't even know it's wrong. You just kind of do it. But as you get older, you're awakened to the fact that, oh, that was a sin. This was right. This was wrong. Well, that's what happened for Adam and Eve. They went, when they entered into that knowledge of good and evil, they were awakened to the reality of sin. So they didn't trust God. They ate the fruit. And now they're going to experience something that God never wanted them to have to experience, which is death. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. So one of the consequences is now of this spiritual disconnect between God and humanity is the fact that now we have to die. And so Adam and Eve had an appointment in the future where they would eventually die. They were also, according to Genesis, pushed out of the garden. Their relationship with God was now broken. God, who once walked with them and talked with them in the cool of the evening in the garden, was no longer there. They were pushed from the garden. And they felt emotions that God never wanted them to feel. They felt guilt and shame. The other consequence was that blood was shed for the first time when God took an animal and sacrificed that animal to make clothing for Adam and Eve because they were now experiencing guilt and shame. We also read that God put an angel at the gate of the garden to keep humans out of the garden because humans could no longer be in the presence of a holy God because they were stained with sin. But, but here's the deal about that angel. Maybe you've never thought about this, but that angel was there as a gift from God because that angel was representing God, speaking to them on God's behalf. That angel was teaching them how to now live in this broken relationship with God. It was teaching them how to stay connected to God. And so they, Adam and Eve, they learned how to worship God with this new strained relationship that they had, and they taught their kids how to do it, and their kids taught their kids, and so on. That, that angel was actually a blessing. You see, even though we sinned, God still wanted to keep a relationship with his creation. That's why he commanded in every tabernacle and temple that was built after that, he commanded that there be a room in that tabernacle or that temple called the Holy of Holies, where God would meet with man. And yes, there was a curtain that always separated God from humanity, and the high priest was the only one that was ever allowed in, and that was just one time per year. But the point is that God loved us enough to keep that connection, to keep that connecting point, even though we were in our sin. So why do I need to be saved? 
because the world around me is broken, my body is broken, and my relationship with God is broken, and I need to figure out a way to fix all of those things. Well, next question was, why did Jesus have to die to save me? Why did Jesus have to die? Why can't God just save us, right? Why did Jesus have to die? Well, let me take you back to the Passover. The Passover was an annual festival that Israel celebrated, um, and they were celebrating the fact that God rescued them from Egyptian slavery and took them from slavery into the promised land, and he gave them the law. He gave them some rules. He gave them a way to live, not because he was trying to keep them from something good, but because he was trying to keep them from hurting themselves. God's law was protecting them from themselves, and so God gave them all of these things. And so what they're doing here in this celebration is they're celebrating the old covenant relationship with God, the old covenant relationship with God. But listen, listen to the words that Jesus speaks at the Passover dinner with his disciples. So at the meal where they're celebrating this old covenant relationship with God, you have the disciples around the table with Jesus, and Jesus looks at his followers, and he says the following words in Luke chapter 22, Verse 20, in the same way, he took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the what? All right, it's going to be some audience participation today, so you're going to read some scripture with me. This cup is the, the new covenant. <laughs> They're celebrating the old promise, the old covenant, and now Jesus is saying, this cup is the new covenant, which is established in my blood which is poured out for you. So Jesus is saying to his followers that he is going to die in order to establish a new covenant relationship between God and humanity. So the word covenant is kind of like a contract, kind of like, not exactly like, kind of like a contract. In a contract, you have two parties that sign a a contract and they pledge to honor their commitments. And the contract Uh, It outlines all the promises and the consequences if those promises are broken. So a covenant is sort of like a contract, except a covenant deals with life and death. And as you read the Old Testament, you'll notice that anytime God enters into a promissory relationship with humans, it's always through a covenant, not a contract. So for example, God made a promise to Abraham, and yeah, this part's gross, but When he made the promise to Abraham, he went and he found some animals, and he he sacrificed the animals, and he placed their blood on the left and on the right, and he walked between all the blood and the gore and the viscera that was there. And what he said is, symbolically, what he's saying when he makes this promise to Abraham, he's saying, let me be like these dead animals if I break my promise to you. Let me die like these animals are die, die, have died if I break my promise to you. That's why when Jesus in Luke twenty two twenty 20 says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, that's why he says in my blood, because this is a covenant that deals with life and death. And the only way a covenant can be a covenant is if it deals with life and death, if it has some element of sacrifice, some element of blood. So what covenant is Jesus fulfilling and replacing? He's fulfilling and replacing the, the um, Old Covenant. The, the word Old Covenant actually means Old Testament. So in your Bible, you have the, the passages in your Bible that we call the Old Testament. That is the Old Covenant. It's the Old Covenant promise that God made with people. And so the, the agreement is, in the Old Covenant, is if, if you obey God, then God promises to bless you. So if you don't murder and you don't steal and you don't lie and, you, and you, you, you honor the Sabbath and you don't cheat and you don't gossip, basically if you follow the Ten Commandments, then God made a covenant promise that he would bless you. Your life will be blessed and the lives of the people around you will be blessed. So let's, let's read about this, Deuteronomy chapter 28. So you can kind of follow along, whatever translation you want to use is fine. Deuteronomy chapter 28. There's going to be some parts of this that I I want you to read with me so it hits home. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1. Now if you what? Faithfully obey. There's a qualifier. 
Now, here's the promise. Now, this is God talking. Now, if you faithfully obey the Lord your God and are careful to follow all of his commands that I'm giving you today, the Lord your God will put you far above the nations of the earth. And all these blessings will come and overtake you because you what? Obey the Lord your God. Do you see this covenant relationship, this old covenant? If you obey, then you will receive. What are you going to receive? Well, you'll be blessed in the city. You'll be blessed in the country. You'll, your offspring will be, built, be blessed. Your, your land's pro, produce will be blessed. The offspring of your livestock, including the young of your herds and the newborn of your flocks. Your basket and the kneading bowl will be blessed. You'll be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. The Lord will cause the enemies who rise up against you to be defeated before you. They will march out against you from one direction, but flee from you in seven directions. The Lord will grant you a blessing on your barns and on everything you do. He will bless you in the land the Lord your God is giving you. The Lord will establish you as a holy people as he swore to you. Right? This is the covenant. This is the promise. God made this promise to us. The Lord will establish you as a holy people as he swore to you, if, what? Your turn. If you obey the commands of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. That's the old covenant relationship. If you obey, you will be blessed. Let's go down to verse 15 now. But if you do not obey the Lord your God by carefully following all his commands and statutes I'm giving you today, all these curses will come and overtake you. So if you obey, blessed. If you don't obey, you're cursed. So promises were made. A blood oath was given. It was declared. A covenant was forged between God and man. And all the parties, human and God, agreed and said, yes, we'll, we'll take that deal. It, it, we'll obey you and you will bless us. No problem. Covenant was formed. And that's exactly what Israel did. They followed the commands of God, and they were given the promised land. They were given all the gold and silver that they would ever need. They were given protection from their enemies. They were so blessed that the leaders from all of the neighboring nations would actually send representatives from their nation to Israel to learn about Israel's God, because they wanted to be blessed the same way that Israel was blessed. They wanted to worship Yahweh God too. And what did God do? He kept his promises. They obeyed. He blessed. But then, as we know, if, we've, if you've ever read the Old Testament, it's like a, a wave of obedience and disobedience. And so there was a time when Israel also disobeyed God. They became wealthy. See if this hits home. See if this is familiar to you today. They became wealthy and influential, and they said, well, who needs God? We have money. We have power. We have influence, we have land, we have military might. So why in the world do we need God? And so what happened? Worship attendance started to decline. Giving started to decline. New belief systems were accepted. Other gods were worshiped. They broke the, prom, the, the covenant. Remember that covenant agreement that they entered into? We'll obey, you bless. Well, guess what? They disobeyed, and so God began to curse them. Not because he hated them. But it's like a parent disciplining a child. You do that to teach them a lesson and bring them back into the household. But the people were like, God, you promised. You said that you would always bless us. And God's like, uh-uh, no, no, no. That's not the agreement. I promised to bless you when you obeyed me. You were the ones, this is God speaking, you were the ones who were unfaithful to me. God actually called them an adulterous generation. They were unfaithful to God and they suffered the curses. This is precisely why when Jesus came, he said that the old covenant was a burden. It's a burden because people, us, we're, we're not able to obey God's law perfectly, for all have sinned. And to make matters worse, you now have the scribes and the Pharisees and the priests who are adding man-made laws to God's law, and then they're heaping the burden of all that law onto the people, and that unattainable obedience was a weight that was just crushing them. God told us what to do, and we can't do it. 
We are broken, our bodies are broken, and our world is broken. And so Jesus gathers his disciples around that table, and he says, this is the cup of the new covenant which is established in my blood. Jesus fulfilled the old covenant that said, you got to get it right. And he established a new covenant, which is unconditional. The New Testament, the new covenant that Jesus established in his blood is an unconditional covenant. I want you to see that in scripture. If you'll go over with me to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. Skip on down to, to verse 6. This is one of those passages of Scripture that maybe if you got a little bookmark in your Bible or if you want to add a digital bookmark on your app, uh, this is one of the ones to to put a little bookmark beside because this is one that you should come back to. You should come back to because it's going to remind you when you're feeling some guilt and some shame for the sins in your life, you can come back to this passage of Scripture and remind yourself that you are no longer under the old covenant, you are under the new covenant. What does it say? It says, but Jesus has now obtained a superior ministry. And to that degree, he is the mediator of a a better covenant, which has been established on better promises. All right, this is sounding good. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then there would have been no occasion for a second one. But finding fault with his people, the Lord says, see, the day, this is a prophecy that was in the Old Testament. It says, see, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant, a new covenant with the house of Israel, that's us too, and with the house of Judah, not like the the old covenant that I made with their ancestors on the day that I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. I showed no concern for them, says the Lord, because they did not continue in my covenant. They, They disobeyed. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. Now listen to these promises. These are the better promises. I will put my law into their minds, and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. And each person will not teach his fellow citizen, and each brother or sister saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. It's not works-based anymore. For the least to the greatest of them, for I will forgive their this is for I will forgive their wrongdoing, and I will never again remember their sins. Let's say that last line together. I will never again remember their sins. In summary, in this new promise, in this new covenant, you don't have to get it right. (laughs) Okay, here's the deal. If there was ever a time for an amen in one of my sermons, (laughs) you just heard God say to you that you (laughs) and I don't have to get it right. Yeah, that's exciting. That's that's the better promise. That's the better covenant. Jesus and his disciples are sitting at the Passover dinner, and Jesus says, you've been waiting centuries for this promise from the Old Testament, this prophecy from the Old Testament to come true. You've been waiting for this new covenant. You've been waiting for this new promise so that you can get out from under the burden of all those laws that you can't keep anyway. You've been waiting for that, and guess what? The time is now. The time is here. I'm going to go to the cross and die for you so that I can establish a new covenant, a new promise between you and and God, but was it really between us and God? See, uh, salvation isn't just, this, this is maybe the aha moment for some of you. Salvation isn't just forgiveness of sin. It's a new way to have a relationship with God. We are his people. He writes his law in our hearts, and he remembers our sin no more. Remember when Jesus came back, for some of you that have studied scripture, If you've been to like an Easter service, we talk about this a lot. Jesus came back from the dead. And when he came back from the dead, Mary was there to greet him. And Mary wanted to give Jesus a hug. And he says, no, not yet. I still have something I need to do. 
And so he stays on earth for a little while, and he reconciles some relationships with Peter, and he shows up to to 500 plus people, and he meets with his disciples in the upper room. But then he goes, and he ascends into heaven, and he walks into the throne room of his father, and he appears before God, and he says, I'm here to establish a new promise, a, a new covenant for them. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12 Jesus entered the most holy place once for all time. Not by the blood of goats and calves, not by the old sacrificial system, not by the old covenant, but by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. Jesus bought us once and for all by spilling his blood. He was the animal that was sacrificed on the side. He was the spotless lamb that was slain. It's his blood that established the covenant. So who did God make the new covenant with? There you go. That's vitally important. God, this new covenant has, it has to do with us, but it's not between God and us. You see, all the old covenants were made with, with people, Abraham and Moses and David, and we, we just kept messing it up. And so now God is like, I'm just going to make a covenant with myself. <laughs> I'm going to make a covenant with Jesus, because Jesus will never, uh, Jesus fulfilled the entire law. He'll never break a promise, and God is incapable of breaking a promise. And so now we have this this promise that was between God and us. It's kind of like or God and, and, and Jesus, and it affects us. It's kind of like, uh, let's say maybe I go up to Dinah, and I'm like, Dinah, uh, I'm getting rid of my kids. I want you to take them. Uh, John, you're going to take my kids, right? Um, so I'm going, to, I'm going to just give my, my, my kids to the, the Kite family. I'm, not only that, I'm just going to give them everything I own, all my money, all my property, everything. But as part of the agreement, they have to take care of my kids forever. Now, the promise is between John and Dinah and myself, but my, my children are the beneficiaries of that agreement. It's the same thing that happened in heaven. The promise is not between us and God. It's between Jesus and God. But we are the beneficiaries of that promise. So now the question is, how do we step away from the performance-based old covenant and into a grace-based new covenant? This new covenant we're entering into is an eternal relationship with God that is not based on what we do for God, but based on what Jesus did for us. And so how do we get from this old covenant that was based on what we do into the new covenant based on what Jesus did? Or to put it simply, how do I get saved? We'll go to Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. You enter into this new covenant through faith. You do not have to obey a set of rules. You do not have to clean yourself up before you come to Jesus because the promise was between God and Jesus, not you and God. This is grace. This new covenant is established through faith in Jesus. Basically saying, look, I'm a sinner. This is repentance. I'm a sinner and I need a savior and I know that that savior is Jesus and I believe he lived a perfect life He fulfilled all of God's laws, and he went to the cross on my behalf, taking my place, substituting his life for mine. And I choose this day to make Jesus the Lord of my life. There's a key word in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, and it is the word Lord. It's not enough to just believe in Jesus. The Bible says the demons believe in Jesus, and they're not going to be saved. It's not enough to just believe Jesus is who he says he is. That's not enough. You have to make Jesus the Lord of your life. That means you give him authority in your life. That means you allow the scripture to dictate how you live. Will you be perfect? No. But you still have to have that moment where you acknowledge Jesus is Lord. And by the way, I don't have time to do a separate sermon on this, but when you acknowledge what Jesus has done for you, that's what gives you the motivation to obey the law. When you realize how much Jesus sacrificed for you and how much Jesus loves 
you, when you are impacted by that good news, when you're impacted by the love of Jesus for you, then you count it a privilege to do your best to do the things that Jesus asked you to do. So what happens, though? What happens when I get, when I get saved? John chapter 1, verse 12. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God to those who believe in his name. Look, Jesus is the only way to heaven. He's the only way to God because he's the only one who made a covenant promise with God. Muhammad didn't do it. Buddha didn't make the promise. Krishna never made the promise. Jesus is the only way to heaven because Jesus is the only one who made a promise, a relationship, a covenant with God on your behalf. And Jesus established this new covenant, not for the sake of religion, not just to save you from hell and send you to heaven, but for the sake of relationship. He gave us the right to be called children of God. This is radical news for the first people that heard it. No one ever assumed that they could be the children of God. They thought maybe slaves. They thought maybe, maybe they would just obey them and they'd be kind of like employees. They never, ever thought that they could be called children of God. And the reason being a child of God is so great is given to us in Romans chapter 8, verse 38. This might be a passage of, familiar, it's a passage of Scripture that's familiar for a lot of you. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. When you are a child of God, there is nothing on heaven or earth that can separate you from the love of God. There is nothing that you can do to make God love you less. Thank you. So why do I need to be saved? I'm a sinner. Aha, right? Okay, probably not. Probably not your aha moment, but maybe this one is. Why did Jesus have to die to save me? Because covenants have to be made in blood. And the only way Jesus could fulfill the law and establish a new covenant was to sacrifice himself for us, to do for us what we could never do for ourselves, to be our substitution. How do I get saved? Repentance and faith. It's not about being good. It's about acknowledging Jesus as your Lord. And what happens when I get saved? I get to connect with God in a whole new way. I become his child who he loves unconditionally for eternity. So what's at stake with this decision? Everything. Let's pray. Father, in this moment, we have been presented with the doctrine of salvation. It is so incredible and so amazing. It's it's hard to even believe that this kind of grace is possible. But you clearly told us this morning, Lord, you told us right now in this moment that we are under a new covenant, a new promise, where it's not about what we do, it's about what Jesus did for us. But there is an element of this relationship that requires human responsibility. In our hearts right now, some of us, we feel this longing for eternity. We know that we were created for something that's bigger than just this life. We realize that all these things around us could not have just happened by chance, Lord, that there's a creation element to all this, and we believe that you are the creator, and because of that, you've set this world in motion to operate on a, a certain, in a certain way. Lord, you've told us what to do to be blessed, and with our broken bodies and our broken world and our, our broken relationship with you, for a lot of it, it's just impossible. The weight of the law is just a burden. So today, Lord, I pray that you would relieve some of us from the weight of that law that is just crushing us, making us feel like we have to, to do more and do better and earn your love somehow. And that's just not the way it works because Jesus went to the cross for our sin. He gave his life for us. He built a new covenant relationship with you. So it's no longer based on what we do, but what you did. So Lord, all we have to do 
All you require of us is to have faith enough to follow Jesus, to repent of our sin, and to make Jesus our Lord. In a few moments, Father, we're going to sing a a song celebrating our, our salvation. And I just pray that if there's anyone in this room right now, Lord, that has never given their life to you, never experienced that freeing, free gift of salvation, I pray that today you would just draw them out from where they are seated. Lord, have them come to the the front where I'll be and allow me the privilege and opportunity of praying with them to receive you as their personal Lord and Savior. And Lord, if everyone in this room is right with you, if we've all received salvation, I pray that you would let us, like, like Paul said, just dwell on the gospel daily so that it would remind us of your love for us and empower us to love other people the way you've called us to love them to sacrifice the way you've called us to sacrifice, to to obey the things you've asked us and commanded us to do, not based on our willpower, but based on your love for us. Help us see it as a privilege to represent you well in all that we do. Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit have free access right now to our hearts and to our minds, that you would remove all distractions and if If today is the day where someone needs to give their life to you, I pray that you would give them the courage to step forward and do that so that we as their faith family can celebrate with them. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.